clickety click. Okay, so welcome to this artist talk this evening, resume and portfolio design for artists and graphic designers. This is sponsored by the Granby Public Library and the Granby Artist Association, and it features Lori Catlin Garcia as our special guest presenter. So why are we here tonight? Because many of you are artists yourselves and you will eventually need to create a resume and a portfolio if you haven't already done so um, in order to advance professionally. And Lori has decades of hiring experience in her role as both an art director and design manager at major companies, including Lego and Hasbro. So whether you're looking for a job as a graphic designer or jurying for a local art show, Lori's insights and her tips tonight will help you be recognized for your talent. So I think that's helpful. Um, just a little bit more background about our presenter. Lori Catlin Garcia has over 25 years of experience as a professional designer. She holds a BFA from the University of Evansville and an MFA from the University of California, San Diego. During her career, she's worked as a theater costume designer a textile designer, and as a corporate art director and design manager in the toy industry. She's making all kinds of art, and that's always been her first love, both personally and professionally. Lori has been a member of the Granby Artists Association since 2004, where she exhibits her artisan jewelry. And by day, she is the creative project manager at the Farthest Pixel LLC. It's an educational media design company. So if you'd like more information about um, the Granby Public Library, you could visit our website. If you'd like more info about the Granby Artists Association, you can visit theirs. And uh, of course, if you'd like to reach Lori directly and learn more about her, her glass bead art and jewelry, um, her email address is also available um, on our program description. So we'll... Um, have that information readily available for you there. And, and having said all that, it looks like everyone's pretty settled and uh, we're ready to go. So let's give a warm virtual welcome to Lori Catlin Garcia. Thank you for being with us. You're very welcome. It's nice to see some familiar faces in the crowd. Um, you may hear some sounds in the background. There's a little construction going on in my house. So I do apologize if you um, hear hammering. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Holly for that wonderful introduction and um, just to say tonight that art directors and people who hire artists are all, they run the spectrum from, they're, they're all very different. So tonight I am going to give you um, some information that's subjective and you just have to remember that everything about art is subjective and what one art director says you know from my age and my experience may not be what you hear from another art director but I have hired a lot of designers um, in my lifetime so I hope I can give you some helpful information this evening and I know we have a wide range of people here we have I'm pretty sure we have at least one high school student who's looking probably to go on um, to study art in college, all the way up for people, you know, I see people on, on the, um, their, their pictures that I know that have many, many years of experience as professional artists. So why do you need a portfolio anyway? A professional portfolio, in my opinion, is usually the most important tool in the professional or aspiring artist toolbox. You really need one to get into a college art program. You need some form um, to get into a, a high quality juried art show. And yes, professional design jobs receive hundreds of applicants and your portfolio needs to be stellar to stand out in that, in that crowd. So the best way for you to rise above that competition is to present your best work in the best possible light. And, and I can't tell you how many times I have seen people I know to be really strong artists that are not presenting their artwork um, in, in a way that glorifies it for the, you know, the wonderful thing that it truly is. So just a little quote here from this person, Jonathan Ive. It's very easy to be different, but it's very difficult to be better. So you really need to think about, you know, being better than the competition and not trying to go so wild that, that you're different when you're presenting your portfolio. 
And if you leave here with one bit of information tonight, I want it to be what I call the foundation. You can't showcase even the most exceptional talent and the most beautiful artwork with unexceptional imagery and bad photos. I have looked at hundreds of applications that have really awful photography. And, you know, that says a couple things to me. If I'm looking at, you know, a selection, usually HR narrows them down first, but there could be a couple hundred graphic designers applying for a job. And, um, you know, if you're the person with the awful photos, they're looking for ways to weed you out because they're only going to interview four, right, out of a couple hundred. So bad photos can just be something that'll get you kicked right out of the running to begin with because they sort of, they also give a message that you really don't care enough to try really hard to have good imagery. Um, the imagery doesn't have to be a photo. Obviously, if your work is small and flat, you can, you know, do a high DPI scan. But that is just the one thing that I want to say right up front. Um, I, I have a, I went too far there. And this is just a little example of images. So um, this is some stuff I made. And um, while I was making this presentation, I put some of these on my office chair and took some pictures. And then my work below this is pictures that were taken by Wendy Van Wheely, who's a professional photographer, who's a member of the Granby Artists Association. So, you know, you can see that there's a tremendous difference and a tremendous sense of care in the um, professional images. Now, I know, you know, as, as artists, we may not be um, always hanging on to a gazillion dollars in extra cash. Um, I have over the years, you know, spent quite a bit of money on, on you know, having good um, photographers take pictures of my, my own work. And um, always when I'm, um, you know, working in corporate setting, I would make sure that any, I did a lot of um, installation and shows and things like that. I would make sure that we had a professional photographer there to take pictures. So um, if you can't afford professional photography, I would highly recommend that you take advantage of um, some of the free online videos on YouTube or on photo, and they can even be very specific. Like there are hundreds of videos available on photographing jewelry, for instance, and um, do the best you can to take your best photos. And just throwing this out to the high school students out there who might be applying for the Granby Artist Scholarship, um, almost all the photography that I have seen on applicants to get that scholarship has not been good. So, you know, if, if you get yourself some good photography in any situation, you're already ahead of the game. It's the most important thing. So I would encourage you before you do anything with your portfolios that you really begin with the end in mind. And you may need to have different versions of your portfolio for different purposes. I make glass jewelry as happy fun time. It's not really what I do all the time. Um, if I were gonna get into an art show with my jewelry, I would do something very different than I would if I were applying, um, you know, like for the job I have now where I do, you know, creative project management and art direction. Um, so I would suggest you state your goals. So I used a high school student as an example. So if you're an aspiring artist, that goal might be, I want a portfolio that seriously showcases my potential to be a full-time graphic designer after college, and I intend to impress the admission staff at the Rhode Island School of Design. And then you might consider what the limiting factors are and um, figure out how you're going to rise above those. So a limiting factor for RISD might be, I looked it up, 4,001 potential students applied to RISD in 2020. Um, about a quarter of those were accepted. So there were almost 3,000 people who weren't accepted. Um, so you need to figure out what you're going to do when you apply to RISD to have the very best presentation you can, you know, to kind of beat out these other um, people. And the intentionality there is you have to figure out a way to make your work stand out. So no, no matter what kind of artist you are, do that kind of exploration, you know, before you um, even start taking your pictures for your portfolio. So here's some of my just general portfolio tips. This seems obvious, but um, 
showcase only your best work and know that less is more. And this is particularly true with students. You don't have to put every assignment you did since you were a freshman in your portfolio when you're a senior to get into RISD. Um, you know, you don't need to showcase if you're going, I don't go for um, the, you know, the type of jobs that I've done in the corporate world. I don't show any jewelry um, when I do those applications. So remember that the person who's hiring you and, and the HR department standing in between you and that person often, um, they, they want you to solve a problem for them. So, you know, they, if they don't want you to come do pottery for them at um, Travelers, don't show me three pages of pottery if you wanna be a graphic designer. That's, um, that's what that piece of information means. So do feature pieces that highlight the type of work you wish to do in the future. Now, if you're a student, you might say, but I'm not a graphic designer yet and I've only had one graphic design class. In that case, I would take the initiative to go out and do everything you can. And even if you do it for free, um, ask your church if they need a logo, um, you know, call up a local business and see if they need a flyer. I mean, do anything you can to get um, actual work that's done for actual people. And the person on the other end, even though you're young, they'll never know you didn't get paid for it. And, it, and it's real work and you can, you know, show that company using it on their website or forever um, or whatever. Um, the other thing that I personally like to see is the journey of a piece. So I always have text in my own portfolio, particularly um, type of jobs that I do. Um, I'm usually trying to solve a problem and I'll talk about that later with art. Um, but I think it's really important to include rough sketches and mock-ups that show the way that you think. Show your creative process. I mean, if you've got a big picture of um, a beautiful piece of calligraphy, and I'm looking at Debbie because she's right next to me in the Zoom, you know, I know that Debbie does a stellar job of, you know, showing her rough work as she's working on it. And, and particularly if you're a fine artist and you're out there, you know, trying to get into galleries or shows or whatever, I think it's wonderful to show the way you work. And I think it's much more interesting than a really slick portfolio that's only has, you know, a whole bunch of really finished images that don't convey the way that you think. I also think if you're a fine artist, you ought to show yourself doing the work. So, you know, if you're a potter, let's see you with those tongs pulling that pot out of the kiln. And, um, you know, if you're trying to get into a juried art show and you have a fantastic booth set up, you might have a beautiful picture of you in your booth, um, you know, showing that your booth makes a professional presentation. Um, I would always say to consider explanatory texts, and there are people who wouldn't agree with me on that, but I think it's particularly important for corporate design jobs. Remember that if a corporate art director is hiring you, they need help and they want you to solve problems for them with your fantastic artistic skills. So you might look at that text um, thinking, what was the challenge? What was the problem I had to solve? And how did I solve it? Um, be prepared to change your portfolio all the time, particularly when you're applying for jobs. Um, I would generally, when I was job seeking, change it for every single job application, you know, um, to skew it toward what they're asking for. That's not unusual. And um, I would highly recommend it. Again, if you're not applying, if you're applying to be a graphic designer, you probably don't want seven pages of pottery in your portfolio. And, and for students, I'm just gonna throw this out. Um, in student portfolios, it's often um, kind of trendy to show a lot of fan art and anime. And, um, and, and there's also um, sometimes an excess of like masterwork copies you might've done in school. I would say if you're a student, be careful with all of that stuff, unless your goal is to like go do anime. Um, Again, it's very, very popular and a lot of student portfolios feature that kind of work really heavily. And I've counseled more than one young person with a portfolio to like, you know, cut down on the anime and show me something um, different or that, um, you know, makes you stand out because so many people um, show that type of work when they're younger. Um, website or PDF, 
obviously it's double the work, so you need to do both. Um, there will be times when it's gonna be enough to direct somebody to your website or to your LinkedIn page, which I'm assuming you are going to take the time to put beautiful pictures on your LinkedIn page too and um, in the header on your LinkedIn page. Um, but generally when you're looking for a job and competing with hundreds of people, your best bet is often to get your portfolio in the hands of the hiring manager um, by seeking an intermediary, you know, that's seven degrees of, or however many degrees of separation with everybody in the world. Um, it, if you're, you know, I have applied for jobs and, you know, found somebody on their board that I happen to know really well and emailed the PDF of my portfolio and my resume to my friend to get them to personally introduce me to the hiring manager and, um, and have that personal reference. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about resumes and bots later, but you really do need to have a website and you really do need to have a portfolio that you can email people, um, which would be my recommendation. So here's the secret sauce. Templates are your friends. You can buy a template, <laughs> thousands of, of templates on Canva, um, I'll talk about Canva in a minute. Thousands of templates on Creative Market and Etsy are available that are actually really beautiful and can save you a ton of time, particularly if you are not a graphic artist, you can get one of these templates. I have purchased these templates and you can um, use the layout and put your own images of your artwork and, um, and your text in there and um, you know the hard part's already done for you because a lot of people who are painters, et cetera, aren't necessarily um, super skilled in the type of programs like InDesign where you might make something like this, but you can buy these and they're going to be in a, um, a format that you can use. Canva.com, I created this particular presentation in Canva. Um, I definitely, all day at work, use the, um, Adobe software, and of course I use PowerPoint, but um, Canva, Canva is a really good free resource. If you cannot afford the Adobe Creative Suite, which costs $1,299 a year for each user in our company, um, Canva's free, and Canva has a lot of good templates, but they have a lot of really bad templates. And I'm gonna show you some of that later, but um, you know, just be judicious. But if you don't wanna even spend the $10, you may be able to find something perfectly fine on Canva that you can use. And now I'd like to go through some um, portfolio page examples. Um, some of these are web, most of these are on the web, but um, they, they correlate with uh, paper portfolios. This happens to be somebody I've worked with quite a bit. It's an illustrator um, I've hired for a few different jobs and two different companies I've worked at. And um, I think her work is exceptional. So um, when I was a design manager for facilities at Connecticut Children's, we commissioned a bunch of murals and we had a call for artists in the state of Connecticut. Um, and we got lots and lots of applications. And this uh, Tracy McLaughlin is the artist that we picked. and. Um, this is um, some pages out of Tracy's online portfolio. And I just wanted to point out to you a couple things on here. Um, she has on the left, she's showing a really good example of a, um, of a rough sketch and a, and a finished sketch, which I love that combination. Um, it's kind of hard to see on my screen here, but um, Tracy did all these designs for murals at the hospital and um, we had them, um, made into murals and, you know, professionally put on, on the walls and on the windows. So we did, um, we did these windows you can see at the top and in the bottom right hand quarter, sh we're showing um, some in an elevator bay. And um, she's showing the artwork in the place where it was used. So you might think of that if you design a logo for somebody that's on their website, you might consider using a screen, a screenshot of how they use um, your logo. Um, Tracy obviously had the advantage of our professional photographer taking these um, professional photos for her. And then you can see over on the right hand side, those are her drawings, which she did in Adobe Illustrator. And on the bottom, you can see how faithfully they were reproduced as murals in the hospital. 
And I also like how she took one of the icon motifs. We use the icon motifs on the signage and stuff. And she's used that sort of in the um, header of her um, page there. These are examples of student portfolios. And um, I um, particularly like them because of the journey that they show. And I, I credited the site at the bottom if you want to go look at more um, portfolios um, on, on that site. But you can see there's this really nice exploration of um, you know this, this person who was an architecture student. And you can see that they got accepted to Cornell and RISD and you know some other really great schools. But but this is a really cool example of this person exploring this shape and um, how that shape translated to an idea. And that's sort of what I mean about how do you think? This shows me how this person thinks and I like it. Um, and then, you know, the next one I think is another um, just really simple but really nice layout. And the one on the right is incorporating sort of a, a journal style and, as the form of the text, which, um, you know, I also thought was different but worked really well. Um, these are just a few people like um, me and my daughter. Um, so this is just a few pages from my portfolio. And at my the stage I'm at it, in my life, I need to do a lot of um, explaining. So like I talked about, I said, this was the challenge and this is how we solved it. And so you'll see in the, um, the upper one, which was for Hasbro, like you can see my drawing in the middle. And then you can see, um, you know, what came out of that. On the right side, my daughter um, is a, um, a graphic designer and a brand designer. And um, this is um, a, a page off her website gallery. And um, some more professional portfolios, um, just to give you some variety. Um, this is a friend of mine, Rick Stramoski, who's um, an illustrator. Um, he does humorous illustration. And I just love his homepage, the one on the left. And you can see if you click on um, you know, any of his various types of work that he does, you come to the page that's on the right and he has a page um, you know, talking about, so he does, he has a lot of famous clients, right? So he does humorous, humorous illustration for magazine and newspaper and book publishing. And then he has the clients right under there. So, you know, he's done Harvard Magazine, he's done um, Science Digest, he's done, you know, he's been in the Hartford Current, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you have credits like that, by all means, showcase them, it gives you credibility. Um, I thought the one underneath that, you know, for particularly like if, if you're trying to be a toy designer or something like that, I thought that was really um, clever. These are just the pages that lead to their work galleries, um, but I thought that was, um, unique if that's the type of work you're doing. And then just three examples on the right of how different people um, do their web galleries. So here's a few, um, you should have received the presentation in your email. Um, I believe Holly sent that um, out. And um, I normally don't write out links. I normally just make a link, but since you wouldn't be opening that so that you could um, actually click on the links. I actually wrote out the entire link here so you could copy it and paste it in your browser. So if you're a student, um, you know, a couple sites that might be helpful are the first one, artprof.org and the student art guide. Um, I highly recommend Skillshare. I actually got a premium membership for Christmas last year, and um, it's a lot of fun to take classes on there, but they also have a lot of free classes you can take. And there are classes on things like um, stuff like we're doing tonight and how to photograph your jewelry. Um, and then Skillshare also has a blog, which can be pretty good sometimes. And so I put in an example of um, one of their blogs that is specifically about examples of what they think are good portfolios. Um, please go on the worst portfolio ever.com because it's kind of a tongue in cheek view of exactly what you should not do. Um, so that one's kind of um, just worth a little bit of a laugh, but a little bit of seriousness. I see that I repeated a link there. I apologize that. Um, there's another one of the do's and don'ts of um, perfect portfolios and then 10 tips to design a killer portfolio to help you get going there. So please, if you have any, um, 
questions about that portion of the program, we only have an hour, so I apologize for going quickly, but I want to leave time for questions at the end. So please, if you have questions about the portfolio portion that you're thinking of now, pop them in the chat before you forget them, and I'll try to answer them <clears throat> when um, we're done with the presentation. So um, particularly, if you're applying um, <clears throat> to be an artist in the corporate world, you're definitely going to need a resume. But you might be surprised um, that sometimes if you're applying to be in a gallery, they might ask you for your for your resume too. So, you know, you should even, even if you're not sure you need one, you're probably going to come across um, a time in your life where you're actually going to need a resume. Um, so these are sort of my little tips for, um, you know, a billion years of, of doing this professionally. It's never wrong to present a, um, a simple, clean looking resume. And I would always recommend, you know, to not go, go crazy. And I'm gonna tell you why in a few minutes. Arty resumes, arty resumes can be a slippery slope. So um, if you, for instance, I've had this happen before, um, had somebody, kind of watermark their resume with a picture of something they designed in the background and then they made it grayscale and solid and they put it behind their all their text. Um, it, it made it hard for me to see the information that I needed. And um, going to the next point, you need to assume that anything you send may be printed in grayscale on an office printer and handed to somebody. I hate to say that people are still wasting paper like that. Every resume we got at my last job was printed, at, you know, printed out on a black and white laser printer and handed to us. So please, whatever you're doing, print it out on black and white, on a black and white printer and look at it. Um, it's not gonna very often get printed in color. And if you put a big watermarky fancy thing behind your text, and if that watermarky fancy thing is blue, and that blue is the same value as the letters on your resume in terms of how light or dark it is, you're not going to be able to see the information that needs to be seen um, on your resume. Um, don't put a bunch of pictures on your resume. It's just annoying. Your pictures belong in your portfolio. Um, and also remember nine times out of 10, HR will see it and narrow them down. And the pictures are just gonna confuse them because they don't know, like, that's not gonna be their gig. And, um, and uh, it's probably not a good idea. A, a lot of people now put a, um, a little picture of themselves on there. I know my daughter does that. I personally, if I were looking for a job today, um, you know, wouldn't want to announce that I am later in my career if I were applying to get a job now. So, you know, you need to think about if you're showing your um, photo and you're applying for like a really senior position and you look really young, you might want to think about not having your photo. And I said already, no watermarks or images behind your text. Um, something that I have done, um, in fact, I do this a lot, you may wish to create many versions of your portfolio that are just one or two eight and a half by 11 pages. Um, you can take that and like you, your resume, if your resume is in Word, you can make a PDF where the first two pages are your resume. I mean, if you're later along in your career, your resume is probably two pages, mine is. Um, and you can have like, put in a mini portfolio page just on that last page. And um, there may be times where that is something really valuable to be able to, it'll be a small file. People may be more willing to take it. They may be more willing to um, email it to somebody else. I, you know, I had a few different titles I was going for um, when I was job seeking. And I had one of those little one or two pages um, for different, for my different personalities. Um, and, and this is kind of annoying, but this is absolutely the truth. If you're applying online for anything that is corporate, 99% of the time, 
your resume is going to be read basically by a robot, which is ATS or an applicant tracking system. And it is, you know, if you want to make something already, this is going to kill you because it will, your resume will turn to gobbledygook garbage in an applicant tracking system. So what does this mean? ATS bots are looking for certain things. When, um, when a job poster posts a job, they are looking for certain keywords. And you can pretty much read the ad and understand, like if they want you to know Adobe Illustrator, you need to be putting Adobe Illustrator, you know, written out, not abbreviated, dot AI in your resume, because what they're doing is they're looking for keywords, basically. Um, if you have a fancy format, it's going to scramble it all up. So um, you may want to keep your pretty, pretty resume, you know, with little columns and icons and stuff um, for emailing to people or giving to people physically. Um, if you like it um, to look exactly a certain way, show up. If you get an interview, print it out and bring pretty resume with you. But it, I would suggest personally that you take the time to create a bot friendly resume. And one way you can do that is if you have, um, you know, your resume done and you select all and you paste it into the text editor um, application on Mac, it's called text Edi editor. Um, I don't know what it's called on Windows, but there must be one. And, and you change it to plain text. Um, you have to do that a lot when you're, you know, doing work and putting it on the web. Um, it'll take out all the formatting. So what you're doing is removing all the formatting. You're going to get a preview of what it'll look like. And you're going to be horrified when you find out that like something you put in a nice column way over to the right is suddenly they're, in, they're reading across and they're inserting from your pretty column in the middle of all your skills. Um, so do use those keywords um, as you're making your bot friendly resume. Um, and if they're looking for certain skills, it might be useful to have a section at the top that says core competencies or areas of expertise or something like that, um, where you can list out those skills so that if they're looking for particular skills, it gives you an opportunity to use them more than once. So you might say, you know, core competencies, Adobe Creative Street Suite, including Adobe Illustrator, Adobe Photoshop, Adobe InDesign. And then below that in the body of a resume, um, when you're talking about the different jobs you've done, you can say used Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop to create Facebook ads for blah, blah, blah. Um, and if they're not specifying a file, like if you're applying on indeed.com or something like that, I cringe to say it, but use docx because a, a word doc is easier for Mr. Robot to read. In that robot friendly resume, you should also try to stick to common fonts and they're basically, you know, all the ones designers don't want to use, um, like Arial Helvetica, um, nothing fancy. And also don't use weird bullets, like um, use the plain little round bullets like I'm using here. That's partly why I use them to show you. You don't want check marks or, you know, watermelons or smiley faces because the bot is going to freak out when it, when it sees that and it's going to, mess up your resume even more. So I guess you can see what I'm getting at is you may need to have a few different versions of your resume depending on what your goal is. Um, templates are still your friends with resumes, but you need to choose wisely. Canva has some really decent templates and they have some templates that are, are so horrible they, they make me cry. Um, Creative Market and Etsy.com also, you know, they have some, some great templates, but again, you know, you need to think about the different ways you're going to use it and pay attention to whether, and whether or not the particular resume is going to um, work for your um, purposes. But again, you don't need to own a graphic design program if you buy a $15 template and use it for your resume. Um, in fact, I have, you know, recently, my, my son recently got his first job after he got his um, grad degree and I helped him pick out a template. I didn't make one for him, even though I could, I didn't want, I didn't feel like it. So I had him buy 
a template and helped him pick that out. Um, I would suggest again with the templates, don't. Just don't do this because this, these are all of Canva. And if you applied for a job with me, you would <laughs> like, I would remember that 20 years from now and not hire you again. I'm kind of kidding, but this is horrible. There are so many reasons why you don't want to do this. You have to remember when you're applying for a job as an artist, or you're trying to get into a gallery, or you're trying to get into school, this is not where you need to show, well, this doesn't necessarily, in my opinion, show good design chops, but you don't, this is, your resume really isn't the place to show your design oom pa pa. When, when an art director or a hiring manager or HR is usually there standing right in between all of you, um, this kind of stuff just gets in the way. And um, I am not focusing on the skills of the information. I'm focusing on um, how bad this looks. And don't do those pictures, right? I mean, if you want to do a picture, be Aaron. Do not be um, Estelle or Claudia because, you know, you just look like you're never going to make it in a, in a corporate office for sure. So I would be super, super careful about a lot of these templates. Um, like I said, there's really good ones and there's really bad ones. You never err on the side of being too professional if you're going to corporate art department. Um, I said before, I wanted to give you an example of those mini portfolios and I put them in the resume section because some of these templates come with this great little mini portfolio template. So this is what I'm talking about. Maybe it's only three or four things you did, but look at Johnny Doe here. I mean, particularly if you're a student and you have very little information on the front page of your resume, I don't necessarily like all these um, chart things over here, um, but this person has pretty thin experience, but look, page two has these, um, images of your work and that could be helpful. It, it won't work in a situation where a robot's meeting, uh, reading your resume, but it could work really well for you. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, stuff that's make, gonna make me sound like everybody's mother, but <laughs> kind of um, just give you some real life examples of stuff that happened to me um, while I was hiring people. Um, so this is my little quiz. Who got the job? The candidate who showed up to the interview in leather pants. Yeah, that happened. The candidate who wore blue jeans that were busted out at the knees and who slouched down in his chair for the entire interview. The intern applicant who looked kind of like the one on the left only, on the right only her uh, shirt was probably four inches higher than that. She came to an interview at my corporate office for this intern app, this intern job. And she wore a half top with her entire little belly button showing. Um, so now I'm gonna show, tell you who got the job. The guy in the leather pants had an attitude to match and he didn't get the job. Um, the candidate who wore the torn blue jeans didn't get the job, although I will tell you in that particular company, you know, I've worked a lot in the toy industry. Um, the companies I've worked at in the toy industry, you can wear jeans. Um, you know, a lot of people are at, in Hasbro would wear shirts with Transformers or Mr. Potato Head or any of our brands. That was cool in the office. But um, that's not what you want to project when you walk into an interview, even if you know they're allowed to wear jeans. Again, you need to look at um, walking into that interview um, for the career you kind of aspire to in the future. And you can wear jeans later after they hire you. I, I personally would be super careful about wearing jeans at all to an interview and certainly not ripped ones. So if you think of it this way, if it's a really ca casual office, um, and you know that from people who work there, you might want to not want to show up in the full three-piece suit and a tie, although you might want to. It, I don't, you know, 
it depends. If you were going to do that with me, you know, in my generation, and it was an office where we wore jeans and you showed up in a suit, I'd be fine with that. I, I would think you were making an effort. Um, if you know from somebody that it's a super young culture and they all wear jeans, you might show up um, in, I don't know, black jeans or something, you know, dressier, but I certainly wouldn't ever show up in torn jeans to an interview. Um, the intern applicant, um, I loved her work and she was a student and I have a soft place in my heart for students. And um, I gave her a sweater and we went and went in to the hospital. I was working in the hospital then. So, and I explained to her when I was giving her the sweater, um, I just told her, I said, look, you know, I am, I'm really interested in your work and I, everything else about this except what you're wearing is working for me. So we're going to go, but you have to put on this sweater because you can't, you can't come in here <laughs> wearing that shirt. And um, that kind of leads me um, to my next thing. And, and this is where I start sounding like everybody's mom. Um, when you're, particularly this is directed at y'all students out there, um, think real hard about um, making permanent changes um, to your parents that can't be undone when you are in art school. Because in art school, um, you know, I know I did a lot of things about my appearance when I was in art, art school. And, um, you know, um, if, if you have pink hair, it might be cool in in fifty percent of corporate offices now. Um, the, the standards are getting more lax. Um, just know, though, when you're making permanent changes to your parents, like if you're in school and want to dye your hair bright green, go for it. Um, but just know when you're getting out, um, getting a job as an artist is very competitive, and if you make the choice to um, tattoo your whole neck or you know, do a whole sleeve, um, just know that is your absolute personal choice. And I don't, you know, I love tattoos. I think they're cool, but it may can't you out of the running for certain jobs. So, you know, when you're in school and everything's going and everybody's tattooing their neck or whatever they're doing, um, and it's all fun when you're in school, when you get out of school, you may be counting yourself out of certain types of jobs. So when you're making those decisions, you need to make those decisions consciously. And I find that a lot of like art programs don't necessarily say that out loud. So I'm saying that out loud tonight um, at the risk of sounding like everybody's, mom. I don't wanna sound like everybody's mom, although I have said this to my own children, but just know, you know, when you're putting that, you know, one inch thing in your ear and you're making, you're enlarging the holes in your ears and, you know, anything that would re require surgery to undo, just say to yourself, when you go that night to do it, if you're sober enough, um, this may count me out of working at 25 to 30% of the jobs in the corporate art world. And, and what I know is that a lot of people who go to art school to do a lot of things end up getting out and there's a lot of jobs in the corporate art world and you may not want to um, count yourself out of them. So that's, that's my mom's soapbox and I'm getting off of it now. Um, it's okay for your interview attire to be interesting. And, and I think I would like to see that if I'm gonna hire people or if I'm gonna, you know, if you're gonna come in to a gallery and be represented, you wanna look cool and all that. Um, it's not okay to be unprofessional. So um, it's worth it to try to sleuth around and find, you know, if you're gonna go have an interview somewhere, ask a lot of people if they happen to know anybody who works there. And then don't try to match that culture. If they say, oh yeah, they can wear jeans whenever they want, try to go a couple steps above that because nobody's gonna fault you for dressing a little bit better than the people in the office. A lot of the times, if it's a big corporation, even if they're allowed to wear jeans, like I said before, nobody's gonna give you demerits for showing up in a suit. You know, um, I have always worked in the corporate world and you know, I went to Hasbro, um, wearing a suit and I brought in a model that I made that actually shot projectiles and I actually accidentally shot the art director 
and I still got the job. But I did shoot the art director with a projectile, but I was wearing a suit. So maybe that kind of evened that out. Um, and maybe you can dress a little bit differently for your second interview after you've kind of figured out the office vibe. But again, try to just go that little extra mile. So you're showing like, I really care and I wanna work here. Um, when you go to an interview, HR will have often printed out your resume in black and white and handed it to all the five people in the room and they're gonna have this really awful looking resume. You might wanna bring six copies of your pretty color resume and your pretty mini portfolio with a, you know, a little gold staple and hand it out to everybody in the room. Like I would generally walk in and say, I wasn't sure, you know, if you had a color copy of my resume, so here, <laughs> and I just hand them out. Um, the other thing you might want to do if you're um, coming to an interview nowadays is think about bringing your small laptop in your briefcase or an iPad um, or some device that you have your whole PDF portfolio on. Um, a lot of times interviews are in conference rooms and they may not pick up the laptop and bring it with them. And they may say things like, oh, you know, that project you did for you know, Starbucks that one time, I can't quite remember what it looked like. You can be, here's, here it is. Would you like to talk about it? It's right here on my iPad. Um, it kind of makes me laugh though, because I can remember like going to an interview in New York City, this is how old I am, with this giant portfolio. And it was really windy that day. And I was walking down one of those streets where the wind just wishes down. And the portfolio was so big, I couldn't walk like it was a sail. You know, and it, it's so great that we don't have to do um, that anymore. I have about, you know, seven of them upstairs in one of the guest room closets if you ever want to borrow one of those big old portfolios. Um, so now I have yapped and yapped and yapped. I am um, only seeing one um, question. And this is a, I meant to mention this and thank you, Debbie, for mentioning this about um, bartering can be possible if you're an artist. So um, I bet, Debbie, did you write that when I was talking about photography? Um, I am a big fan of paying fellow artists for their work. So, um, you know, that's, that's really important to me that we as artists support each other and, you know, buy each other's work. But I have done some mean bartering in my time. And um, I have bartered with um, Debbie. But um, you know, if you have a relationship with a photographer and you're a painter and they might enjoy owning one of your paintings, um, we could, you could um, decide that you were going to barter your services. And, you know, I've done that a lot. Say, well, you know, if you do an hour long photo shoot, I'm going to give you um, these earrings. You know, I've had potters make custom pots for me for a bracelet, you know, so I've done, I've traded, um, I've traded jewelry with Bill Simpson for his artwork. So, you know, I've done a lot of that and it's certainly a possibility. And um, that, that was a really good point, Debbie. Um, what we could do now is I'm gonna check the chat. Nobody else has posted any, um, posted any comments in the chat. So I think what I could do is stop screen sharing because I'm done talking to you and um, I'm just wondering if you'd like to turn in your video or not, but if anybody wants to ask a question or if you just feel like putting it in the chat, I will do my best to answer it. Because that's that the formal portion of this presentation is over. So I don't know if maybe Holly wants to stop the video for the question section. So Lori, thank you very, very much for covering all of that. I, I was having flashbacks to my interviewing days back in the day, and I'm, I'm not an artist, but a lot of what you said was definitely, um, it hit home. So, um, and I also had to hire over the years too. So it was interesting to hear your take on it. Um, but thank you for sharing all of that. Um, uh, we have, we've had some other people join us late. Um, and so, yes, what I will do at this time is we'll stop the formal recording portion of the um, presentation.